Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in this afternoon for Judy Simpson. Vermont's love affair with craft beer dates back more than 30 years. In 1987, Catamount Brewery, uh, Brewing uh, rather, opened the state's first modern craft brew plant in White River Junction. Ten years later, the first certified organic brewery in the United States opened in Middlebury. And in recent years, Vermont breweries and their beers have been ranked among the best in the world. So the chances are pretty good that you've heard of a Vermont brewery. A Vermont meadery? Well, probably not. To begin today's program, we join Across the Fence intern Joseph Couture in Colchester. The process for making mead is insanely simple. Honey mixed with water with yeast to turn it into alcohol. Vermont is known for its selection of craft beer. Here at Gronfeld Meadery in Colchester, there is another type of craft beverage hitting Vermont shelves. Mead is an alcoholic beverage made from honey. So beer starts with grain, cider starts with apples, wine, generally speaking, starts with grapes. Mead has to start with honey as the fermentable. Ricky and his wife Kelly grew up in Delaware. They met at Middlebury College. They started Gronfeld Meadery about five years ago. They've been expanding their selection of mead as well as the services they offer ever since. Things we've made everything from beer to cider to sake to sauerkraut to cheese, anything. We, we like to play with that stuff. But professionally, we decided to go with mead, and it was partly because Vermont's beer scene was so full. There was so much good beer. We didn't think we needed to add to that. But we were seeing that as cider was picking up steam in Vermont, we saw that potentially people here could realize, oh, there's more than one craft beverage. There's not just beer, there's also cider, and maybe we can start to introduce mead. So a lot of people have, if they have any thoughts about mead in the back of their minds, they think Vikings, a lot of people think Robin Hood. Uh, it does show up in Beowulf. It also shows up in The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and it is the national beverage of Ethiopia. It is uh, the oldest known fermented beverage in China. Anywhere that people had apiaries, access to honey, they have made mead. And part of that is the simplicity. Honey plus water plus yeast uh, was the purest sugar source that most people knew. Mead has a rich past. Ricky and Kelly are bringing it back with some Vermont style. So the question of where we fit in the craft world is an open question. Uh, we actually have two different brands we brew out of here. We're very open about that fact. I am currently the head brewer for both, though I am handing one of them off to my current assistant brewer. Uh, but we have Grunfeld Mead, uh, which is our original one, and Havoc Mead. There are differences between the two brands, mostly Grunfeld are classic recipes, uh, historical recipes, and Havoc I get to do whatever the heck I want. But since there was no competition, no one knew where to put us. So we helped create the mead shelf that now other meaderies can come and join. While mead may be made with honey, what the clients produce isn't always sweet. So what we make is different from a lot of the other mead on the market. We make a craft mead, so it comes in cans, which you know, look like your beer or your cider. It's got some a little bit of light carbonation. It has beer cider strength as far as the alcohol content goes, and it's not sweet. A lot of mead on the market is very sweet. People think honey, they think sweet, but of course you're wines don't have to be sweet even though grape juice is sweet. Mead isn't the only taste of Nordic culture on tap here. There's also a full menu to feed your inner Viking. Part of the thing too is just sitting and drinking and drinking and drinking is not actually how we wanted to wanted people to experience our mead. We wanted to have food. We wanted to have a full experience of you know community coming together, enjoying a meal together. There's something about that that's not simply about alcohol or even about getting calories into your body. There's something that is much more meaningful and enjoyable about sitting down with people and the Scandinavian inspired food we have. We try to use only Viking era ingredients just to keep it fun. Really works well with our product, bringing this idea of feasting, which we feel like mead is a perfect drink for. A lot of people have been coming here specifically because of the food and not because they have a particular interest in the mead we make. And so that's been really neat too. We feel like we're providing something that you can't get anywhere else. But mead is something that is special in people's minds and I don't think it will ever go away. Uh, it is a beverage that is meant for feasting and that's not really an experience most people have anymore. 
So as our culture turns back towards each other, which I see coming as people jump off of Facebook and start looking at each other again, I think Mead will actually have a place pre-built in steins of it, horns of it, around a big table or a fire. Half a decade in, Grunfeld Mead has found its place in Vermont's craft beverage landscape. So I think that the fact that I didn't know a lot of things and I learned from trial and error is that's where I am and that's how I got here. And if I knew even a little bit more about what I was in for, I think I would have gotten scared and balked. So I'm glad that I didn't know and I'm glad that I, it gave me, you know, a false bravery to actually just go ahead and do something and I'm really glad that I have done that. Meat is something that's still open for you to write your own story around and I think a lot of people should take that advantage because it doesn't come around very often. An ancient beverage in a new setting. So heed your inner Vikings and raise a stein to mead. In Colchester, I'm Joseph Couture with Across the Fence. Gronfeld Meadery is one of two in Vermont. The other is Artesano Meadery in Groton, and that's also owned and operated by a husband and wife team. Joining me now is Across the Fence intern who produced the video story you just saw. Joseph Couture is a senior at Champlain College, and he grew up in the Northeast Kingdom town of Lunenburg. Joseph, you've done a lot this semester. This is your first visit, I think, second visit to the studio. Yeah. Um, so thanks for coming in. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. What did you hope to accomplish uh, when your internship got started earlier this year? Um, two things, technically, I guess. The first thing I really wanted to do was do my own piece, like I just did on the metery. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to finally like, kind of do my own news package and actually have it on television, which is great for my portfolio. And then the other thing I wanted to do was basically just get a general idea of what it's like to work in a TV program. Um, there's like the class can only teach you so much of like the theory and stuff. I wanted to actually get a real understanding of it. So when my dean recommended uh, reaching out to Keith to see if I could get an internship here, um, I was happy to do so. So you would say, and I think I know Keith would agree, I would agree based on the things I saw, you accomplished the stuff you set out to accomplish. Yes, yes, definitely. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty proud of the metery piece, actually. I already showed it to my family. They were very happy with it. They're showing it to their neighbors, um, our neighbors um, back home. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely proud of that, and I'm definitely proud awesome. of like everything I've done here so far, yeah. and I'm excited to continue on with uh, that as my career. Now, you've, we've already said you worked most closely with our associate producer, Keith Silva. Mm -hmm. You had a, the final project, if you will, is what you put on the air. What are the other things that you did throughout the semester? Um, it was like a variety of things. So we did a lot, obviously, on like farming, so precision ag, um, no-till. Then we covered other things like the UVM mascot change. Um, we also um, did a piece on like the catamount. Um, and uh, no, all good stuff. I yeah. knew that there was a variety of things. Uh, uh, the viewers don't know this, but I would often uh, get into the editing room and you're hunkered down working away on things. In yeah. fact, before we go, we're going to show a piece that Keith reported on, but that you were the uh, you were the editor behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there something, Joe, that you'll uh, that you'll remember the most? Um, I think what I'll remember most is when we went out to uh, work with Mike Kessler, um, the tracker, um, for the catamount piece, actually. Um, that was a lot of fun going out up into the woods with him and just seeing how he has such a different perspective on, like, the land around him and how, like, what can look like just a outgrove of trees and stuff. There's actually, like, a lot going on there. And um, you can see the animals that have been through there, how big they were, what they were, and stuff like that. Um, it was very interesting seeing that, and I like working with people like that and seeing um, the skills they have and the jobs they do. A great observation. So, so uh, let me ask you, what's next? Uh, where does Joseph Couture head, head now that he's wrapping up at Champlain? Um, I'm hoping to get my roots settled in Burlington. Um, I've already got two jobs so far. There's one full-time job I have, and then there's another uh, part-time I have as an audiovisual technician. I'm hoping to keep my skills sharp in the media field. And um, I'm hoping to slowly make that my full-time job and then just keep moving from there. That's really great to hear. And uh, Joe, again, congratulations on your piece um, and all your outstanding work throughout the semester. Really appreciate everything that you brought to us at Across the Fence. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, one of the editing projects that Joseph worked on was a new program in 4-H that's designed specifically for teenagers who are interested in science. Here's the story from Joseph and Across the Fence's Keith Silva. 
could be a kind of organic life. If you were a teenager in the 50s or 60s, science fiction might have been the only way you learned about life on other planets. In extreme environments. And kind For today's teens, science fiction is fast becoming science fact. If we do find life somewhere else, we don't necessarily expect it to look like us. So this talk by ecologist Hilary Immick on astrobiology, the study of life on Earth and in space, is the first Vermont Teen 4-H Science Pathways Cafe. UVM Extension 4-H Teen and Leadership Specialist Lauren Traster coordinated the event. This is a national effort. It started in New Mexico, and the folks there were so successful in what they were doing, they received a large grant to try to expand this idea across uh, the U U.S. So they have a goal of getting at least one teen science cafe in every state. So we are the first in Vermont. Okay. The formula for these cafes goes like this. Take teenagers interested in math and science, add a scientist from the community, Provide everyone with free pizza and voila. You've got a way of learning that's relaxed and fun. In school, it's very formal. Um, it can turn a lot of students off. And science, when done informally and casually and just through conversation and interesting ideas and sharing cool research, the hope is that you're going to spark interest in our young people to understand that science is more than just a lab coat. And liquid methane has a lot of the same properties as water. I really like science in general, so when I like heard about this, I thought this would be like a really great way to get more involved in science and meet. Isabel Petrucci like is a junior at Essex High School. Getting to meet a real scientist is one of the reasons she came to the cafe. Most kids, like the only connection they have to science is like through their teachers. And I mean, obviously they know a lot about science, but it's not the same thing as being an actual scientist and doing like actual research and like work. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just gonna be interesting for um, kids to see how exactly that works and just like what they can do later on in the future. The casual setting of the cafe makes complex ideas like life on other planets a little easier to understand. Hearing that message from a scientist who also happens to live nearby makes a world of difference that, like, to Lena Ashu. Whereas when you can actually see what you can do within your state, like Vermont, you never think like of NASA in Vermont or of these big like science experiments happening in Vermont. But I think definitely through this cafe, we can see that there are professions within the state, within science that are really exciting and engaging. Ashu is one of the members of the 4-H team leadership team helping to facilitate this event. Unlike her, most of the teens in attendance aren't 4-H members, which reminds Ashu of how much 4-H has to offer to anyone and everyone. Well, I think 4-H generally as an organization, a lot of people don't know that there are a lot of different parts of 4-H. I think the purpose of this um, Teen Science Cafe is to show people that there's a whole broad range of um, professions and expertise and different organizations that you can get involved in through 4-H. Is the gas usually visible? Well, you can see the bubbles that it forms. In addition to their talk, each speaker provides the attendees with a hands-on experiment. The teens were asked to take a soil sample and add water. If their sample produced bubbles, it was viable and could support life. This hands-on opportunity is in line with the 4-H model of learning by doing. Getting to learn hands-on about a topic she isn't studying in school is what Ellie Ramirez Richer likes about this event. I think it's more engaging to like, and it, it's something different than school. It, it's a subject we haven't gone over so far, which is okay at school, but like I, I like to learn about other stuff other than just what we're learning at school, which is kind of nice. This gives you opportunity for that. Traster believes giving these young people a chance to meet and talk with someone who has a job they might like to do one day has benefits far beyond this event. A lot of times what happens is emails get exchanged and that young person now has someone that they can actually contact and say, hey, I came and heard you speak or you presented a workshop. I'm interested in this. Could you provide me some direction on are there articles I can read, websites I can visit, Facebook pages? Is there a school or a college that offers a, you know, a really good program in this? I think that is a tremendous benefit by connecting the professionals with our young people at the time that they're beginning to think about what path they want to take. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Discovering life on other planets is the next big leap for humankind. 
And who knows, maybe one of the teenagers at this Vermont Teen 4-H Science Pathways Cafe will help all of us take the first step. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. For more information about teen science cafes or other opportunities in the 4-H program, you can call toll-free 800-571-0668. That's 800-571-0668. You can also go online to uvm.edu slash extension slash youth. That is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence. Thank you.